Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Camilo Perez Bustillo. I'm Director of Research and Advocacy at Hope Border Institute. So I'm currently based here at the border, have been for five of the last six years, but most of my work has been in human rights and civil rights advocacy and litigation in the US and in Mexico, especially in Mexico for about 20 years. So I kind of bring, bring that transnational perspective. That's gonna be one of the things that we're gonna be sharing. We're also sharing this time with my colleague Ilka. Hi everybody, welcome you. Uh, my name is Ilka Vega and I'm the communi uh, community engagement and administrative specialist at HOPE. Uh, we're very happy to have you all here and um, very excited to hear about uh, what you all got to say. I'm in the process of moving, in fact, to a new position at Stanford University as a, as a researcher. So I'm in, I'm in transition as well. <laughs> I'm in a, in a process of mobility as well. And so I'm gonna speak from that, from that space. One of the most important things I think about what we wanna share with you in terms of the perspective of Hope Border Institute is that for us, the experts are the folks in the room and the folks in the communities that are affected. And so we have great respect for the colleagues who are around the table, colleagues like Jeremy, I don't think Nick, I don't know if Nick Natividad has arrived yet, but he's another colleague that we've worked with very closely, Carlos Spector, of course we know of Gabriela's work, but also something that was seminal that was really key in getting us rolling in terms of the reflections we wanna share with you was the meeting with my tocayo, Camilo, and Connor with the team when they came to El Paso. Uh, we had a very rich exchange and have continued to exchange since then. My, my colleague uh, Emiliano was part of that process. He's another expert to whom I defer, who's based at the Colegio de la Frontera Norte in Ciudad Juarez. Um, and so I, I, I think it's always important to recognize where we're coming from in terms of the contributions to our work. Now, what is important about um, what Gabriela just shared to you about the welcome to this space here at the border? Um, so I wanted to sort of echo that welcome on behalf of Hope Border Institute. Hope Border Institute, you can find us online at hopeborder.org, is a community-based, human rights advocacy organization dedicated to the defense of human rights on both sides of the border. We're faith-based in our origins, so it's the convergence between a faith-based perspective, community-based perspective, border-centered perspective, and human rights. That's sort of the, the package. Um, and that's what's gonna be reflected in what we're gonna share with you. But it's especially important at this historical moment when this is the region, as Gabriela alluded to, where the greatest injustices in the US today are concentrated. As they were in Alabama and Mississippi at the height of the African American Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s, or as they are currently on Europe's periphery in the waters of the Mediterranean. The victims, los rostros, son los mismos. It's within this context that we propose to approach the issues that convene us here today in this workshop. It was at an equivalent kind of moment and place that the German Jewish philosopher Walter Benjamin reflected on the relationship between contexts like this one, like those I've alluded to, and the deeper currents and pulsations of history. He wrote these words that I'm about to cite as he stood at another border, analogous to ours, convergent with ours, in September of 1940, at the border between France and Spain, having fled persecution and the deprivation of his rights of citizenship in Nazi Germany. We are living one of those moments that inspired that kind of reflection. Benjamin had been denied an exit visa from France and an entry visa into Spain. And it's within that framework, this is just if you want to know the, the context, this is the cover of our most recent report that we'll be sharing with you in print tomorrow, but that's available online. Uh, the title of the report is Hope and Resistance at the Border. So that's gonna be sort of an underlying theme. But really where we start with is Walter Benjamin. The traditions of the oppressed teach us that pr the permanent state of emergency in which we live is not the exception, but the rule. 
Many of you may be familiar with his theses on the philosophy of history, where this reflection is contained. Giorgio Agamben, many of you are familiar with as well, more recently has drawn on Benjamin's work and has developed this concept of states of emergency applied concretely to issues regarding the rights of migrants. So that's the overall framework for us. That's how we approach, how we construct the human rights approach that we want to share with you. Of course, time is going to be the enemy, but we'll do our best. Now, what are the concrete dimensions of this current state of emergency in the US-Mexico border region? Again, Gabriela was alluding to this more generally. Let's be very specific. Mass kidnapping of over 300 migrants, migrant families, a week ago, 20 miles from here, in Sunland Park, in the Sunland Park sector, that is the place of convergence between Nuevo Mexico and Texas, in the El Paso sector, which is where we sit, the El Paso sector according to the administrative structure of DHS. And what we had was an armed militia group, I think many of you may be familiar with this story, called the United Constitutional <laughs> Patriots. Again, detaining and kidnapping armed families, right? That's, that's the context. So if we want to talk about kidnapping in the context of the border, we have to take this kind of phenomenon into account. Our argument would be, our thesis for the purposes of this presentation, and here I would defer to my colleagues from Colombia who are familiar with these issues, like my tocayo Camilo and others, but also my colleagues in Mexico who have worked on these issues for many years, when we talk about kidnapping in contexts like the border and in contexts like migrants, what we're talking about essentially is mass crimes, mass human rights crimes. We're talking about state criminality. It's a very particular uh, approach to criminality that we would share with you. So, of course, we're going to be talking about organized crime, what we would call in Mexico, and Carlos Spector has written about this, about this authorized crime, el crimen autorizado, no solo el crimen organizado, right? We're talking about state complicity, state imbrication, embedding in these crimes. And so what we just saw at the U.S.-Mexico border, it took a week, one week, for the governments to respond, local, state, and federal. One week after this mass detention, and kidnapping of 300 migrant fam migrants and their families took place for the armed militia group to be compelled to leave the site. Took a week, right? So, I mean, this is simply the tip of a much deeper iceberg which cuts across all of our work. I, I don't probably need to go to the video at this moment. I, I don't know, how many of you have seen these images? How many of you have seen the images of the militia? Yeah, okay. Um, but there's a deeper analogy as well, as I was deferring to my colleagues in terms of Colombia and in terms of Mexico. When we talk about kidnapping, we are talking about, in truth, forced disappearances. As they're understood according to the framework of international criminal law, pursuant to articles six, seven, and eight of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, which is a crime that has been characterized as a crime against humanity. Because what we're talking about in contexts like the militia at the border, but also in contexts that many of us are familiar with in Mexico of systematic state terror and persecution against migrants because of their migrant status, culminating in mass human rights crimes like the San Fernando massacre and the San Fernando mass graves in 2010 and in 2011 and massacres like Cadereyta, and many other crimes still undetected in Mexico, many of them characterized simply, quote, as mass kidnappings. They have to be understood as human rights crimes. That's the bottom line. What that means is that a framework of transitional justice is therefore activated, right? So that's essentially how we get to the essence of our presentation. So it's not simply an analogy. What we're talking about is convergent forms of state terror on both sides of the border that culminate in mass human rights crimes against migrants, targeting migrants qua migrants because they are migrants, because of their migrant identity, 
And this has led tribunals of conscience, with which I've been working, and many others, including the Permanent People's Tribunal, to characterize crimes like San Fernando, and potentially crimes like the ones we just saw committed by the militias on US territory, to characterize them as a form of migrant genocide, which is unfolding. So again, these are the perspectives that we would like to share with you in terms of the framework. And this takes us, of course, back to Colombia. I mean, essentially, what we're talking about here is a comparative framework of analysis between models of state terror in Mexico and in Colombia, convergent framework of analysis about processes and models of state terror, how state terror unfolds, and we're talking about how the Colombian model of state terror was essentially imported to Mexico. That's what is commonly referred to as the drug war. But what the drug war covers, and what we need to uncover, what is left lost in that narrative, is that it's in fact a war against migrants and against human rights. It's not, quote, just the drug war. That's how we have to understand crimes like San Fernando. That's how we have to understand what's unfolding at the border. That's how we have to un understand what has unfolded in Colombia. In Colombia, essentially, state terror produced mass forced displacement. We know about the transitional justice process in Colombia and the fact that many of you have been engaged with that and that that continues to unfold. But the analogy and the convergence is how in Mexico, the importation of that model of Colombian state terror has produced mass forced migration in Mexico and Central America. So that's the other dimension here. What that means is that when we talk about crimes of mobility and immobility, we're talking about human rights crimes. So if there's one thesis we would share with you and insist on as a framework for understanding what we're trying to um, frame in terms of these issues is the importance of recognizing migrants, what we refer to in Spanish as pueblos en movimiento, migrants as collective subjects of international law and of transitional justice. So again, if you have mass human rights crimes along the lines that I've sought to describe, of course, in a very summary manner, that triggers the duty of transitional justice. But that means the recognition of sujetos colectivos, of collective subjects, of those rights. What we're talking about then is a generalized pattern of recurrent serious violations of internationally recognized rights, human rights crimes, et cetera. What I sought to summarize to you previously. What I summarize here is how do we look at these crimes? We're talking about the vulnerability to persecution of this collective subject of migrants, which encompasses what are traditionally referred to as economic migrants, but also those who are entitled to varying forms of international protection, including asylum and refuge. But we're also talking about other categories of those uprooted, again, pueblos en movimiento, that are not sufficiently accounted for by those existing categories. So we need to transcend those categories. The, the empirical data, the social experience transcends, the theoretical frameworks, right? And so they need to be transformed. That's why it's so important that we not, quote, just talk about kidnapping, but that we understand that wherever there is state acquiescence, complicity, collusion, co-responsibility, actions, omissions, failures to act, there's a duty to prevent serious human rights violations, which clearly has been omitted, at minimum omitted, in the best case, in scenarios like San Fernando, um, and again, the militia, because there was clearly evidence of acquiescence by the US Border Patrol in the detention and kidnapping of those families a week ago. And that's how those cases are gonna have to be approached, right? So when, we're not just, quote, talking about kidnappings, we're talking about forced disappearances and all that that implies. We're also talking about other dimensions of crimes against migrants that we've sought to detail here that are, I think, obvious to many of us who understand these phenomena. The detention and deterrence of asylum seekers, zero tolerance, family separation. Let's talk about family separation just for a moment. If there's something we're, quote, known for in this region is that it was family, it was here where the policy that became family separation exactly a year ago, April 23rd of 2018, 
that policy of family separation was first tested here was tested here in the El Paso sector. We documented that in one of our, one of our reports that's on the, uh, on the web that's called um, a Sealing the Border. But the bottom line is this, and other colleagues who are here can, can share their insights about that. The key thing is this. It's understanding family separation as acts constitutive of torture and of forced disappearance, and therefore family separation is also a crime against humanity. So again, we're talking about the most serious levels of human rights crimes. Of course, migrant deaths in transit, in the desert, in the Mediterranean, <laughs> in the desert, here. Um, and of course, we're talking about this experience with the militias, but we're also talking about in Ciudad Juarez, um, the experience of feminicide and of violence related to the drug war. But again, violence related to the drug war, which has to be understood as human rights violence, as structural violence in that sense, which means state responsibility, which means transitional justice. So there's a duty of transitional justice on both sides of the border. So if, there's, if there's a single thing that's key, I think, about our presentation, is that transitional justice in this context, because of the nature of crimes against migrants, and because of the nature of migrants themselves as collective subjects who transcend borders, transitional justice must thereby be also transnational. Not just transitional, but transnational. It must understand the border as a space that transcends borders, and it must understand um, transitional justice as a duty on both sides of the border, as to convergent patterns of state terror. What you'll see in the film tonight, the extraordinary film that's being shared with you, thanks to our colleague, Carlos Spector, um, and the case that is uh, embedded in that film, that's a case that dramatizes these issues, no? Um, basically, how the drug war served to uh, encubrir, no? to cover, in a sense, state violence, and how state violence is at the center of the drug war and continues to be. So that means we need a complementary process of transitional justice focused respectively on crimes in the U.S.-Mexico border region, on Mexican territory, and in related countries of transit and origin. And I think any of us who know anything about transitional justice know that the region of Central America is very rich in experiences of transitional justice. But the one sector that's been left out of those processes that continue to unfold in Guatemala, in El Salvador, in Honduras, and beyond is migrants as subjects. And so it's inserting migrants into those processes and articulating the processes that would unfold at the border with processes in Mexico as a country of transit and in the countries of origin. It also means that we have to understand that there's a transitional justice process underway in Mexico that is unprecedented, that is still limited, that is still incipient, but into which these issues need to be inserted as well. And again, connected with ongoing processes of transitional justice. Um, I know we're gonna run out of time. I wanna move to my colleague, Ilka, very soon, but simply understanding Mexico, Central America, and Colombia as comparative case studies regarding the relationship between drug wars and state terror, highlighting what the key convergences and divergences are. Again, we can share this all with you in, a, you know, in the full presentation and in a, in a more detailed text. And again, Mexico is a case study of the implementation of the Colombian model of state terror. Again, in Colombia, it's forced displacement. In Mexico, it's forced migration and understanding cases like San Fernando in that context. Um, all of this has to do with a counter-hegemonic approach to human rights. We don't need to belabor that at this moment, but we're talking about human rights from be below, from a decolonial perspective. We're talking about the border as a neo-colonial and colonial space, and having to understand human rights within that framework and uh, these various different uh, dimensions of that. Um, for us, the two key rights that are at stake when we look at the current flows at the border are the right to a dignified life, and within that, which has been widely recognized in the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and elsewhere, and even in initially increasingly in the European Court, but also we're talking about the way in which the right to migrate, jus migrandi, is embedded in the right to a dignified life. In other words, wherever a right to a dignified life is impossible, because of material, structural conditions of violence that impede the fulfillment of those rights, in other words, economic, social, and cultural rights, that triggers the right to migrate. Right? And so those are the frameworks for which we need to struggle. Um, 
We're talking ultimately about the relationship between human rights, hegemony, and utopia. That's what's behind all of this in terms of the theoretical frameworks. I mean, I, I would just call your attention to that framework. Uh, Ernst Bloch, Enrique Dussel, uh, Dr. King, hope and resistance as driving forces. Um, just a, a little detail for those of us who are interested in law and history, and this is worth underlining. When we talk about the need to, rec to affirm unrecognized rights, like the right to a dignified life and like the right to freedom of movement, what we're talking about is what has always characterized the relationship between law and history, which is the way in which law is constructed in history. In Spanish, we would say, el, el derecho nace en la conciencia, pero se hace en la historia. No? And so this is what we're talking about in terms of an overall framework. And what we're saying is that if we look at every single one of the current crimes recognized in the Rome Statute, as crimes against humanity or war crimes, all of them, for a significant portion of recent history, were considered perfectly legal and legitimate, including genocide and slavery and forced disappearances and torture and so on. And so history moves, but it moves through social movements, no? And it moves through the movements of migrants affirming these unrecognized rights, and that's what the caravans are about. That's also what my most recent book is about, if you're interested to like see some of the the deeper theoretical context for this approach. Here it's simply a summary of what we're up against and the forms it takes. The US border as a context, as a case study. Um, the need to recenter our approach at the border. The need to understand this dialectic between hope and resistance and between the border as a laboratory of injustice and the border potentially as a landscape of hope. No, and I think that that will be very key in what you'll hear from my colleague Ilka. And what we're talking about is these concepts of the border as a wall, as a bridge, as a window, and as a mirror. Any border, but this border in particular. The wall is what we're up against. The bridge is what's potential in terms of unifying us. The window is the border as a space that enables us to see things that we would otherwise miss. The mirror is the border as a space that reflects who we are, where sometimes we don't want to look. Right? And for us to then look at the practices that are considered now normal at the border, such as militias detaining and kidnapping migrant families, right? that was normalized right? over the last 10 days, and ask what that says about us as a society, as a civilization, in terms of rule of law, in terms of our conscience. And that means that the border is also a prophetic space. It's a prophetic space literally, and it's a prophetic space figuratively. Literally because this is where crimes are first rehearsed and implemented and tested. And then based on that, applied, weaponized nationally. That's essentially how the border has been handled, right? But it also means that the border is a permanent challenge then to our faith and our conscience. And nothing can be more prophetic than that. So, you can. <laughs> uh, well, just once again, I want to say um, bienvenidos y bienvenidas uh, to everyone here. I'm very happy to be here present with you and be representing the Hope Order Institute with, with my colleague Camilo. Um, I have a lot of admiration and respect for your work, and, and I'm here just uh, very excited to learn about what you all have to say. Uh, but I'm also here feeling um, probably the same contradictions that some of you that cross the oceans to come talk about immobility might be feeling, right? Um, but I think I think we're not alone in this. Um, see, like I feel, and I feel the same contradiction because I also just came from um, another country this morning, just a few blocks that way. Um, but I think this contradiction finds a place, and I think we're not alone in this. I think the borderlands themselves and her peoples embody these contradictions, a juxtaposition of both mobility and immobility, all of this at the same time. And as Gabriela was saying, we're also here at a very important and crucial moment where rights of mobility are being redefined, reinterpreted, denied, creating <coughs> issues and crimes of immobility that take so many different forms and complexities right now. And so what I want to talk to you about is just a little bit of what that experience has been here and, and contextualize it a little bit more. So 10 years ago, Ciudad Juarez um, 
the city where I grew up and I still call home, was called the most dangerous city in the world. A change in the political party in Mexico declaring the war on drugs, um, as well as the recession of 2008, created a lot of instability within the cartels that started fighting each other over the territory. And so the Mexican army was brought in, creating a militarized zone that was something close to a war zone. We had curfews, no young people in the streets after 10. <laughs> you were lucky if you could make it home without seeing someone laying cold in the streets. Nobody was out after 6 p.m. Businesses closed or moved here to El Paso. As the fear and terror spread, when the cartels and the organized crime started asking for ransom, easy money, by kidnapping or threatening to kidnap family members if la cuota, the money, was not paid. And there were shootings at school and public places and bars. They did not care who was around. I cannot tell you how many times they called to my home and um, they were pretending to be a family member asking for money. How many times my grandmother picked up the phone and it was someone trying to get information about us or someone saying that I had been kidnapped while I was at school. But see, I was, I was actually a lucky one. I, I was very privileged and I was born on the right side of the border, just a few meters this way. And I was able to cross to find safety. And so my mom during that time uh, she made the effort and the sacrifice to pay for my education here so that at least for a few hours of the day I could be safe. And she said that whenever I pay the four pesos, she would breathe again because she knew I would be safe, at least for that time. And yes, I would complain all the time about waking up at 4 a.m. in the morning and having to wait two and three hours at the line and it was cold and it was hot and I didn't know I wanted to do it, but I could reach safety and I could exert my right of mobility to find that safety, safety, something that others couldn't. And no, I was not more moral and my fear was not greater. We had loved ones that were not as lucky. My mom herself lost a very close friend of hers. She was kidnapped and murdered. My mom was mugged at gunpoint twice and I was also in a couple of shootings, one as I had just crossed back the border. One of my friends was also kidnapped and he was released days later as through the spreading of his photo in social media, the kidnappers realized they had the wrong person. One time when I was at school, um, they made us know that the dad of one of my friends had been kidnapped. And so being a Methodist high school, we walked out of the classrooms and we hold hands and we prayed. And that afternoon, among the students, they started collecting money and they raised a big part of it and, and the dad was released. See, we took, we did what we could. We took the tools that we had to protect our families and our communities. I, I heard a story um, last week that I wanted to bring. Um, it was an article about some moms whose children had been um, kidnapped and some of them murdered who were starting to use drones to penetrate into areas guarded by the cartels, looking for answers and clues, looking for <coughs> justice. And I think when I hear stories like that, of, of resistance like that, um, I think it is not a coincidence that acts like that and people like those and like those brave moms and communities like mine get called resilient. Because you see, Ciudad Juarez is not and has never been a violent or a dangerous place. It doesn't matter where the media is, it is not. Instead, it is a city that was kidnapped by the cartels, that was raped by capitalist interests under NAFTA, colonized, fractured by foreign borders, and dehumanized by the narrative that denies the fluidity and the richness of its identity and confines it 
to an immobile other, constantly otherizing it. But I think, I think the kidnapper has a face. And I think that it is important that, that we turn also our eyes to that direction. Because it is the systems of injustice that target and cage and persecute specific genders and races and nationalities and classes and take the form of kidnapping, human trafficking, the prison industrial complex, and now and for a long time are targeting migrants and refugees. Legitimizing the caging of people coming to our borders to seek refuge. Threatening and actually taking their children away from them, separating families. So I think as we are all here today, I think it is very important that we take this opportunity to make visible some of the materializations of those forces and that we are very critical of what they do and how they foster, they create, and they normalize these forms of kidnapping. I think by expanding these definitions too, we are, we're really fighting to defend the right of mobility and its different configurations. Truly, the right of, of mobility as an enabling right, enabling right that allows us for, for us to, to reach the realization of all other rights, from the civil and political to the economic, social, and cultural rights. But most importantly, I think, by expanding these definitions, we're able to map who's profiting from all of this. What are the real causes and structures and people behind all of this? But we are also able to challenge a narrative that is currently and right now dehumanizing the victims, criminalizing the victims to justify and disguise its own evil. And I think as, as we talk about our work, I think it is very important that we keep in mind the survivors and that we lift up their voices to recognize their agency, their fight, their struggle, their human dignity, and their resilience too, their richness as people. I think that has to be our focus as we discuss this topic, to bring back the humanization that they have been ripped away from. And so as we talk about these issues, I, I wanna invite us to have them in mind and I want to thank you for your work, for bringing this justice into this place. So thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Camilo, and thank you, Ilka, for, for this first presentation. And well, <laughs> uh, it was a really powerful, powerful presentation. So thank you for, for sharing this with us. Uh, we have half an hour uh, to just start an open conversation between us and Camila and Ilka. So I don't know if someone, Ernesto, hi. And, and hello everyone, sorry, my name is Camilo. I've been in contact with you <laughs> by email a couple of times. I'm sorry for do introduce myself. Yeah, so thank you for coming. It's really, really nice to have you finally here after all these months of constant clean board banding in emails and calls and all that stuff. So thank you, Ernesto. Yeah, I, ju I just have an issue with the notion of transitional justice, right? Mm -hmm. So it comes after a regime actually changes. There's, there's some break. And I think, so I have, I have three issues. So it's not really a question. One, I don't know if it's the Colombianization of Mexico. Because there's a historical way in which the Mexican state had used massacres and disenfranchising indigenous people for 500 years. So actually state violence is, is constitutive of the way Mexico is shaped today. Um, it's, it's gender and race. and. So, and I think that, that Colombia has similar issues, but I don't know if the model is exported really. So I would, I would, I, I don't know, uh, try to thematize that. Then the thing that I really disagree with is the notion of transitional justice, as if there was a regime change. It, it seems to me there's no such thing. The regime has been built and designed this way for a long time. And, and thinking in terms of transitional justice makes, makes it look like there's going to be this kind of democracy after the military dictatorship, like, like we are importing actually now the enforced disappearance framework from Argentina to try to think Mexico. And I think that's complicated to say the least. Um, and, but, 
basically I do agree with the other bit of like the, the state working through organized mm -hmm. crime and the kidnappings being part of a larger strategy of insecurity and, and um, the kidnapped cities. In fact, in the project we were discussing what, what is the subject of kidnapping. It's just ransom a person or can we talk about kidnapping a whole region? Which I think you could. I mean, there are good, very good examples out there. Um, so, Jay, yeah, just the, the two challenges there, which I, the especially transitional justice one, and um, yeah, that's it. Should we? No, uh, yeah. 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 The, well, <laughs> it's going to. Yes. Um, yeah, sorry, I haven't got a name tag, partly because I'm a bit of a gate crasher to the conference. I'm sorry, I'm Claire Moon from um, the London School of Economics. I'm a sociologist there. And I just wanted to echo Ernesto's comments about transitional justice. And I've worked on this theme for quite a long time um, in, with respect to South Africa and um, also Argentina. And I'm extremely concerned about currently the tub thumping about transitional justice currently in Mexico. Um, number one, it's the use of the label itself, okay, so there's no political transition and absolutely no possibility of justice. To me, it's just completely the wrong kind of framework. And, um, one, uh, okay, so some of this is about, you know, an argument I've been having about the, the, the use of the, p the terminology itself because the term historically referred to political transitions, so transitions from one kind of regime, usually an authoritarian regime, to a more democratic regime. And this was, the, the idea was really born in the, you know, in the 80s with um, Argentina's transition then became famous. South Africa really made it, made it famous. Um, but it's also been applied, of course, in contexts where there's a transition from conflict to peace. Now, neither of those optics fit what's happening in Mexico. The other thing is, I think it's an idea that's running out of steam. It's over-proliferated. It's kind of eating itself. And one of the issues, I think, is that um, the burden of violence continues to be borne by the victims within the framework of transitional justice. Um, because the compromises um, that, that are usually made by political elites or by parties to conflict fall on the victims. So victims typically are granted reparations that are usually insufficient, that you know, reparations programs that are over-ambitious and don't work. Um, so that's another argument. The other uh, issue is that there's no possibility of um, dealing with perpetrators in Mexico because there's no distinction between the state and organized crime. And I can't see, um, mm. uh, you know, within <coughs> the foreseeable future where those things can even be, um, start to be pulled, apou pulled apart. Um, and the, and, and uh, really the, the, the language of transitional justice is a language of, of politics and, and state making. So this is usually an idea that's inaugurated by the state to reflect on either a past period of, of conflict or a, a, a past regime. And um, it's used to, to re-found a sense of nationhood and rebuild um, a, a national identity on the basis of certain princ inaugurating principles such as truth, justice and reconciliation and so on. And I just don't see this kind of language as, as having any plausible hold on, on what's happening in Mexico. I think, you know, actually we have a, a dire need for some, for some new ideas, for some different ideas for envisaging and moving these, these kinds of processes forward. So I don't disagree with um, bringing the, the, the language of um, gross violations of human rights to think about what's happening on the border. I think that's, you know, that's a very powerful argument to, to be made. But transitional justice, I have some serious um, reservations about. Also, regarding the issue, um, I recommend there is a very good report uh, written by Laida Negrete, who actually uh, worked on Presunto Culpable. And she has a very interesting report uh, published two years ago where she says uh, if the, the transition happens, uh, money, lots of money and time needs to be invested. And in the best case scenario, it will take around 11 years to concrete these. So it's published already. And also, I really like your analogy on wall bridge, window slash mirror. Um, all of those can be simultaneous. And yet, not all spaces of the border 
um, violates human rights is not the same California as Arizona or Texas. It's just very different. And then again, in California, it's very different. The east side, for example, Mexicali, Tecate, or even Otay as Tijuana. So um, yeah, I would, I would be careful with that. But it's very interesting. Thank you so much. Yeah, not to exhaust the, the issue on the transitional justice, I just want to add my sense because I think you put it um, very well in, in terms of the concerns. The only thing is that I would actually challenge that we need a new framework. And because I think the framework is there and that is the problem of transitional justice. Why not just call it justice? I mean, why does it have to be transitional? Why do, have, why do we have to make compromises? And maybe taking a step back, I think I, I really like, and my presentation tomorrow was actually going to draw upon precisely that framework, so we can just save it and, and, <laughs> and, 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 and add on just a few points of what you already did, because I think that one of the key elements that um, we're missing, and I would challenge, you know, you have the right to life. You have before those rights of, 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 of mobility and, and economic and social rights, you have also fundamental guarantees that are at, at the core of the violations here, and, and I think that that's, that's the point that you are making, but you're not saying that because you're jumping ahead into yeah. legal categories that are a little bit more complex than just very simple elements that to me and for the organization I work, the International Commission on Missing Persons, is the right to life and the right to an effective investigation. And those rights are already there and, and are in place. Uh, and you don't need to create new institutions. Who are the institutions and the authorities that need to be tasked uh, to be looking at these things? And that is where the challenge comes because um, I would like to propose that in addition of all the layers that are so important that you have presented to us that I really are fascinating and you have very well illustrated of structural, individual, and social, and legal, um, we have at the core, and I think as, as a Mexican we would recognize this, just a complete lack of a proper judicial system. There is a, a fallacy of a judicial system, a fallacy of justice um, that breaks down because of a large magnitude of crimes, um, because it has always been a system that has been used for political purposes and never actually really to serve justice. So when we're faced, when we're confronted with these uh, crimes, uh, which is what you've called them rightly so, uh, we're thinking about all these other solutions, um, stepping away from what actually should be, which is the state and the judicial system who has the obligation for an effective investigation for any violation, whether committed by the state or not. Um, and to me, that is, uh, that is a huge challenge, because if you're thinking of 11 years for a truth commission or whatever, how do you reform a judicial system that has never existed? And I think that, that to us is the biggest, biggest tension. How we, because we are so confronted with this huge monster of impossibility, we start finding patches outside of it. Um, and I, we don't have an answer, but what is happening, for example, in Colombia, what are the solutions uh, sought for under the peace agreement? There are transitional institutions that actually duplicate, duplicate what other institutions should be doing already, what the HEP and what the tr search unit uh, are supposed to be doing on missing persons and on, on transitional justice is the obligation of the prosecutor. And they are duplicating those functions, creating a new layer of new institutions just to supplement for an institution that is not working. So how do we tackle that? And I, you know, I don't have an answer we can discuss, but I think that addressing that centrality of the state, rebuilding that state that actually doesn't exist, is, is something that, that, that should be at the center of the attention. Yeah. yeah. Can I add just? I, I actually think the state exists, and that if you sign that way, there's, there's a very clear way in which you can I think in that we talk about selective rule of law, very selective rule of law, rather lack of rule of law. So it's not like Papua New Guinea, which you can actually take out a gun and defend your land. Then the states in Mexico can go and catch you. And get you. So I think that's selective rule of law, and it's a completely different challenge, which looks a little, a little bit more like Colombia, yes, in which then the powerful can own these aspects. <coughs> but the other thing is that we are missing a trick with 98% crimes not even investigated, it's, it's really the state in, the, in this kind of governmental apparatus what needs to be revealed. And it's, and the patches, I, the other thing that you said that I, I find fascinating, I always think about Mexican justice as like version 2.0 of something else, right? Like it's like updating 
Yeah, you, you, the patch is in existence. The, the only thing, the, the bit that works is that patch. <laughs> so, so maybe that's the way we need to think the, the state, but just the property. Okay. So. Okay. I wanted to echo what Justin said because in the 1990s there was this tremendous wave of kidnapping that you got brought to Poland to see a really concrete example. <coughs> the federal government in Mexico City set up the anti-kidnapping squad through flyers. Sure. So to get back to your point, yes, you need to have the original institutions doing what they're supposed to do and not having these fixes, these patches that actually make it work. So a few a few things. I want, I want, <laughs> just a few. Just a couple. Just a couple. First, um, this should be clearly understood. Let me disavow any assumed endorsement of existing models of transitional justice. So I would simply embrace and incorporate the criticisms, the, the various different critiques that have been um, shared around the table. My point is it's there, <laughs> right? Things are labeled transitional justice for, you know, for reasons of funding and the way hegemonic ideas work in the academy and so on. Um, I think I mean, what's clear to me is there is no reason to have faith, either in the Colombian context or the Mexican context, which are the two I know best. I'm originally from Colombia, so I have that framework, and Mexico is where I've lived most recently, so I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons I look for these convergences. Um, there's no reason to have faith in either of those processes. Both of those processes are deeply flawed. The Mexican process is hopeless. <laughs> you know, clearly, there's no regime change. There's no real commitment by the new government, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, again, I would simply embrace the, the criticisms. But nonetheless, it's being framed through the key authorities in charge of these processes now, Alejandro Encinas and others, as a transitional justice process. So they're talking about a truth commission for Ayotzinapa and a truth commission potentially for other major mass crimes and so on. I still haven't heard of one for San Fernando. That's a whole other issue, the forensic issue that I know many of you have worked on. There's the Comisión Forense and other work, the Fundación para la Democracia y Estado de Derecho, et cetera. But the key thing is this, there is that framework we have to interrogate that framework, we have to be critical about that framework, et cetera, and I think we have to go much further. Definitely have to go much further and, and break out of the, the traps of that framework and that paradigm. I think there are many ways in which it's been exhausted, but I think what is key is, to the extent those frameworks exist, migrants should be recognized within them, right, as subjects. And so I think that's simply my position as an advocate, not as a, as a, a researcher, but as a human rights advocate. If there's a tool, we had better be included in that tool, right, to take these matters seriously. As to Colombianization, again, a lot of this was the problem of brevity. I completely agree in this sense. When I talk about Colombianization, Colombianization, and about the export of the model, I'm not talking about the drug war. I'm talking about the model of state terror, right? And so what I'm saying is when you look at San Fernando through the prism or mirror of Colombia, what you see is the Setas as a paramilitary group that had its origins in the Mexican military in its most elite unit, right, that went rogue, supposedly, like the anti-kidnapping squad you described. I mean, that's the story of the Setas, right? And that's what ended up culminating in San Fernando. And so you're talking about essentially a paramilitary group that should be understood that way in terms of a legal framework. So I, I, I'm talking about Colombianization in that sense. In the same way in which mass human rights violations in Colombia between 1980 and 2010, put, you know, put whatever dates on it you want, were sort of swallowed up by the drug war framework, right? In Mexico, the same thing has happened. The drug war has been used to encubrir, to cover up mass human rights crimes. And so San Fernando is kind of dismissed. It was the setas who killed. Excuse me. It was the state that permitted the setas to kill, right? It was the state that acquiesced in the setas killing. When San Fernando happened, both the massacre in August 2010 and the mass graves that were uncovered in April, May, March, April uh, 2011, um, Tamaulipas was the most militarized state in Mexico. There were roadblocks on every corner. And somehow those busloads got through. And somehow these massacres were carried out. So I mean, that sounds a lot more 
like the case law, the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court, when it looks at massacres in Colombia and in Guatemala and so on. So it's state terror. No, I think, again, so it's Colombianization with that very important asterisk. Um, and the la I, I, basically, I would simply embrace <laughs> the criticisms, and I absolutely agree with uh, the colega who stressed the most fundamental rights, the right to life, the right to um, uh, effective investigation, et cetera. Yeah, I don't know if you want to do that. Yeah, it's just that I think that the Mexican government doesn't need a drug war to cover up that stuff. I mean, <laughs> they, they, they tried to. They, now, now it's trendy. They, they yeah. use that because yeah. that's... But in, in a way, if you think about the, the, the evolution of the Mexican state with whatever is rock, it's actually not these rock militias. They, I mean, I don't know if you have seen the Netflix Narcos. That's based on some very decent research uh, that the guy that went to Cambridge had these historical records. And now that they opened the archives, you can see how this DF, Dirección Federal de Seguridad, was totally part of the, uh, the, cent the centerpiece of the Mexican state. So when you say this colonization, I see, well, the Paracos, you could say that's very similar, yeah. But Mexico had the caciques before, they had a different name. Sure, sure. So, but they do, they, they perform similar issues mm -hmm. in which they always had this kind of like contubernio with the local authorities. They can pursue whatever they thought was right. But this same group of anti sequestro wouldn't do the same thing in Mexico City, mm -hmm. right? And they know there are these tacit norms of what is the geographies they can impose their logics into. Mm -hmm. So I think that's actually obeys to a, a a wider, longer history of colonial endocolonialism in Mexico. And Colombia has a similar history, and I actually think that comparison is really relevant, not just because I, I work on that comparison, but uh, because it, it really looks like that. But I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't assume this is something that comes from Colombia or, or that looks in that sense, because it's a long tradition. Actually, many of the journalists when we were in Mexico with the 43 were surprised that somehow indigenous people were now valuable for the public sphere. Right, because this has been happening for for a very, very, very long time. So that's 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 really my point. Yeah. And I was just curious to ask, it's more like questions and and things because you you mentioned about the evolution. So it got me thinking. I think in the context in which the transitional justice was framed when we were like originally contemplating it, it we were actually in a period of transition in Mexico, right? We were coming through uh, under the administration of um, um, Manuel López Obrador, which at that time, he had a lot of expectations on what it was gonna bring, and, and parts of the authority and the proposals that were being brought forward was about bringing justice to the migrant community and framing it around transitional justice in some sorts. And so I think that's kind of like where the conceptualization of using the term transitional justice was coming from too. I mean, I might be wrong too, but I think it was a period that was seen as a period of transition in that sense, just because a lot of ambitions that were preceded, I think um, it has demonstrated to be <laughs> not the case, uh, but I also think it, we're not along in the challenges that a transition in political systems function. Uh, other countries that also have tr um, been through that transition also uh, come through their realization so sometimes it's not as, ambition as, as ambitious as proposed um, as they become more democratized. Um, but I also think that in terms of framing it, um, not transitional justice, but using the um, transnational framework, I mean, and this is a question to everybody here and, and your experience involved, I don't know if that will bring um, just a transnational aspect of it in terms of treaties, if that will bring any accountability that could be added extra in regards of, of this process itself and bringing uh, justice to the migrants versus if it was just left to individual countries to have that on their own and manage it on their own, kind of having like that accountability between countries. But I don't know, it's just a, a thought of proposition for people. I'm, I, I'm, I'm an sorry. anthropologist, and I do sustainability work, so <laughs> not my field, but. And, and just something quickly along those lines, uh, and I think this was a very important part of the, of the critique that was shared about um, the error of looking at transitional justice as state-centered, the need to decenter it. And so when we're talking about transitional justice at the border, especially on the US side, obviously, given the current administration and those likely to follow, um, th there's no faith in the state at all that, that we would uh, call, convene. Um, in fact, this would have to be a process activated from civil society. No, and so what we're saying is to take transitional justice back, which is, for example, in Guatemala, I think those of us who know the case of Guatemala, which is a foundational case, the first truth commission, and many would argue the most effective one, was non-state, was from the church, right? And so that's, that's a very different model 
than the subsequent model in Guatemala and elsewhere. So there are, there are um, non-state based potential models of transitional justice that might be relevant. That's one thing. The other thing is, one reason we started talking about transitional justice in this context was it so happened, and it wasn't simply uh, you know, coincidental, the first hearing held in Mexico to inaugurate its supposed process, entre comillas, of transitional justice was in Ciudad Juarez. So several of us who were here attended that, that hearing. And one of the things that was no, most notable about that hearing is that the issue of migrants was completely absent. I mean, Carlos and I attended the migrant workshop, which was hopeless, was a farce, was you know, absolutely a joke. There was no attempt to situate the issue of violence against migrants, including cases like San Fernando, which is a border case, right? If we're talking about San Juarez and its region, um, in the transitional justice framework, there's a vacuum. And so there's a need to fill that vacuum. So we're talking, about, again, transitional justice as a tool for civil society. Um, I don't know if there's anything else that we have time to. Yeah. We have six minutes, so Jeremy and Emiliano. Um, I can just speak. Right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> or is it bad for the, I mean, I can say six minutes. Compose your, you can compose your yeah. thoughts. <laughs> I'll, I'll change the subject a little bit, I guess. Um, I, I wanted to thank Ilka for her comments. I really loved kind of starting off this workshop with that experience of growing up and, and kind of living through this, uh, this period here. And, and you mentioned something that I think that really stands out to me, which is you know, this issue of cyber kidnapping, virtual kidnapping, right? These phone calls that have become omnipresent, right? Something that's become you know normalized to the extent that people joke and laugh about it and upload videos of themselves playing along with pretend kidnappers here right um, I, I wonder how you you would view those as playing in as kind of echoes or shadows of this other types of violence that we see around here and I um, you know how you see those playing into the the very concrete and real events that you described as well. I uh, sorry my English is so bad. I understand, but it's difficult to me and speak. The in Mexico, the only transition that we have is the is the old pre is coming back, no? <laughs> That's the real transition in Mexico, no? No, the El Nacional Revolucionario is coming back and defeat the neoliberalists and Chicago boys, no? And the technocrats. That's the only transition, the real transition that we have in Mexico, no? But it's very sad, imagine that the only true commission that we have in Mexico is Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> it's super true, it's, it's very sad, but it's true, because we don't have true commission in Mexico. We never have, and I think so, we'll never, we're gonna have a real, true about different issues, Ayotzinapa, Cadereitas, este, San Fernando, here, Juarez, no? Howard say the, the, the unit against secret kidnapping is doing kidnapping, no? The, 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 the office who has to protect the huachicola and the gasolina stall, they are doing that, no? So it's very sad, this condition, no? And I think so, the, the, the importance of the concept of justice, transitional justice is that, begin to think about the truth, what happened? Who, who did it, no? Name it. That is very important for the second process that is the, the judicial, judicial process, judicial, how to say that? The process, no? The process. And then for the reconciliation, no? Because if we don't have truth, we can speak about reconciliation. And we can speak for the last step that is the condition for not repetition. No? Reconstruction, the institution, the reconstruction, the social framework, I say. So that's important begin to, to talk about, no? But I, I agree with Deborah that we, we have to be very careful to don't make another structure who have to do the same that the real institution have to do, that is justice, no? And the problem in Mexico and in all parts of the world, but in Mexico in particular, is the impunity. We have numbers like, más del 
90, hay estados, 96%, 99%, ya estoy hablando en español, <risa> that, that have this level of impunity. It's, it's amazing. If we don't change that institution, we, we can never begin in, in talk about no repetition and justice. It's, it's very sad. No? Just, Just speaking of crimes and justice, we wanted to share with you um, two cards that are um, seeking to commemorate the faces we saw at the end of the presentation, which were two cases that you might have heard about of migrant indigenous Guatemalan children aged seven and eight who died in Border Patrol custody, both of them, on December 8th and on December 24th this past year, and who are yet another set of crimes, right, that is pending on the agenda of memory and truth and justice and so on. And so what we did is simply put together cards with the images and the the story, one is of Felipe, Felipe Gomez Alonso. Again, tienen rostros, tienen nombres, tienen historias. Um, and the other is the card of Jacqueline e Amal Rosemary Calmaquin. Um, son, dos, son dos tarjetas. Huh? On behalf of Hope, we went to their home villages to retrace their steps, to begin to tell their stories, and we're going to continue to do that. And so just we wanted to share that as sort of a campaign concrete way of demanding justice as to those two cases. Both of those cases are being litigated, but simply as civil matters. Um, really, what we're talking about, again, are human rights crimes, speaking of the right to life. No? and jokes as, and humor as catharsis. And that's very Mexican, el humor negro. No, and, and, and for example, in terms of the normalization of evil in this country is the game cowboys versus Indians. That's normal. And who, want, who do you want to be? The cowboy. Uh, and the norm, normalization of evil under the Trump administration in terms of the popularization of, of racism and xenophobia. And I think it, it is a, a social consequence of the structure of particular societies that um, they really are ruled by law, not, not it's, it's a rule by law, not rule of law, which is part of my presentation. Okay, so we have the last minute. And yeah. Sorry, well, I, yeah, I just want to try it in, in regards to that. Um, I, I very much agree with that. Um, I think it's been very much criminalized, just um, normalized, just as normal kidnappings have been normalized as well. Um, and, and just to talk about, you know, the um, an anonymity, <laughs> anonymity of it, um, just anyone taking advantage of it, not only just criminal, uh, uh, criminal organizations or the cartels, but really just it went on for anyone with an evil <laughs> <laughs> spirit to want to like take advantage of the situation and, and, and profit out of this, um, which increases, of course, the impunity, because how do you track down on those things? And you don't want to get, in this case, the government involved uh, here in conversations, if, if they could have you know, that manipulation, because it would just make it more problematic, especially in, in Mexico. And so it really lifts it, I think, again, up to us and, and to really those cities, right, and, and developing those cultural strategies to fight back, because it's really... Um, even through that sense of humor and through the different tools that the community came up with and the improvisation, some of them more spontaneous than others, that the community, like Ciudad Juarez, was able to come on the other side and now laugh about it, right? It's because that humor, those cultural strategies and, and resilience skills that, that allowed us to be here today and, and, and to be able to move forward. And, and I think um, it also talks a lot about, you know, for me, something that is key is like the truth and reconciliation part of it as well. Uh, speaking the truth, but also challenging the narratives, right? And this framing it around cultural strategies, I think it's key um, to to just pose that that challenge to the narrative. I think it is very important for us to to constantly be doing that as we go through these processes, whatever judicial process they take. Yeah. No, just to say thank you to Camilo and Anilka uh, for the presentation. We have 15 minutes break. 
to have a coffee and some water, and I think it's some, right? Some, some things coming, <laughs> I don't know what, but yeah. And again, just an applause for, for Camilo and Ilka, and thank you for opening the, the workshop. <coughs> so, so yeah, so see you in 15 minutes with the first session. That is going to be kidnapping, detention, and migration flows. So see you in 15 minutes.